he's teaching at 360 in Ray Paul this semester because there's so many different groups in that student. Uh, they, as they say, imitation is the yeah. highest form of flattery. Exactly. Sincerest. Sincerest. Okay. All right. So let, let's put all the food away because I know some of you are, have been taking uh, the other test and you you need to you need all the you know, blood sugar again in the bloodstream. So I can kind of understand that, but let's let's hope, let's go ahead and get this class started. <coughs> uh, we have a new homework assignment. It's called the Treasure Digger instead of Big Hunting. So now we're digging for treasure. Um, it's the same format, okay? So I will show you the source file, and then we'll, we'll take a look at this to make sure that we know what kind of homework assignment we're dealing with. Okay, so we'll go ahead and say tar xzbf treasure dot tar dot gz. go. All right, so when you look at this code, it is kind of the same kind of deal. We have a whole bunch of uh, let me get rid of the other uh, This way I can make use of more of the screen space. There we go. So it's about the same as the other homework assignment. You know, you see a whole bunch of dot int, which is the same thing as a dot long. So those are all 32-bit, you know, chunks. Dot word is 16. We don't even, I don't even bother with dot bytes. The only one thing that is special about this one, or two things that is special about this one, compared to the previous one, is we have this thing here. So at label L1, I have a 32-bit thing that is um, storing the value of L1 minus six. So the only thing you have to remember is L1 as a label is representing an address. But an address is nothing more than a 32-bit thing that turns out to be a valid location in memory, okay? In other words, L1 has a value. It can, you can add to it, you can subtract from it, just like any other integer. You just don't know exactly where it is. But you don't, you're not supposed to have to know exactly where it is. Yes? Is that value the same throughout uh, all the 32-bit computers? When you compile the program, it will probably stay the same, but your code has to work with you know, my setup as well. In other words, the way I link the program may change the location, the, the actual location. So what you need to do is to make sure that you don't refer to absolute locations. You can make everything relative to L1, okay? Because then, no matter how I link the program, it floats, okay? This entire chunk of program, this entire program floats together. So if I insert additional code before, the whole thing just gets you know, shifted down a little bit. It's no big deal. Okay, so the idea is do not use absolute ad addresses. Don't spell out the actual address. You can refer to L1. Okay, so once again, you know, we have a empty slot here where you can fill in with whatever you need, but you cannot change the addressing mode. In other words, you cannot add a dollar sign to it. Where there's no dollar sign, you cannot add a dollar sign. Where there is a dollar sign, you cannot remove the dollar sign. The third instruction, just like the second instruction of your uh, of the previous homework assignment, uh, there's nothing for you to specify here. You cannot change this instruction. There's nothing else to specify. So you kind of have to remember what this instruction does. It, it's the same thing as the second instruction of your previous homework assignment. Um, and then the, the other thing that's special about this homework assignment is we have some add instruction here, one add instruction, one subtract word instruction, and one subtract byte instruction here. So instead of moving things around, around, I just make it a little bit more interesting by using addition and subtraction also, okay? Um, but other than that, you know, whatever technique we used in the previous homework assignment, you can, you just have to extend those techniques to handle addition and subtraction for this homework assignment. Are we doing okay so far with this homework assignment? Okay. I think, you know, if you don't remember how I solved the previous homework assignment, you might want to watch the video again. Just focus on the idea and the techniques. Um, and as I said, you know, the only stumbling block is this thing here. This is the only thing that we haven't seen before. But L1 is really a 32-bit number, 
and subtracting six from the 30 32-bit <coughs> number is just it will just give you another 32-bit number. The question is, what are you going to do with that 32-bit number? Okay. Are there any questions about this particular homework assignment? And you can see that I don't even bother with different bases, so these are all base 10 numbers. So you will have to do whatever you need to do, okay, to get the homework assignment done. Yep. I know you say we can only mess with the stuff in the underscores, but can we put in comments if we want? Yeah, you can. You can put in comments, and before you turn it in, okay, you know, there's no. I, I'm not gonna make sure that you. There's no way for me to make sure that you don't mess around with the program before you turn it in. So it's just that when you turn it in, you cannot change the address in those. But you can add additional comments and let it stay when you turn it in. So that's not a problem. It's a, it's a good idea. Just adding more comments is a good idea. Okay. Any other questions? Yep. What about the low end? The what about? The negative number. The negative number. No, no, no. This one? Under uh, L1 this one? Six, yes. What does that mean for? What is it? What does it initialize? Wow. What do you think? Uh, just to, just okay, so how do we get started with this guy? Okay, it's a, it's a negative number. So there are, there, are, there are several ways to approach this problem. So what do you want to eventually, what do you want to turn it into? The other one. The other one. Yeah. Which is also a base 10 number. We only have base 10 numbers here. I do not even bother with base 16 or base 8 numbers here. This is also a base 10 number. So what, what is the first thing that you have to do? I'm just giving away the first step of this homework assignment, which is coincidentally the first step of the previous homework assignment. What is the first thing that you need to do? Convert that to yeah. hexadecimal. Convert everything to hexadecimal or binary. Okay. I recommend hexadecimal, so you would you wouldn't have to write and type a lot, because you know a 32-bit number has 32 zeros and ones, but it only has eight hexadecimal digits, and hexadecimal digits also line up at byte boundaries. Two hexadecimal digits is one byte, so for the most part, hexadecimal can do everything that we need to do with binary numbers, but it's a lot more concise. Yes. So um, for a 32 for a 32 bit uh, signed number, like will the uh, most significant bit, like the bit 31, uh, would that still be the signed bit in this yes. case? Yes. Yes. The most significant bit is always the signed bit if you choose to interpret the 32 bit thing as a signed value. Okay. Yep. You can do two com yep, when you have once you have the binary representation, you can find out you know, what value it is using um, so for instance in this case, okay, so you don't you would work with um, seven nine seven eight nine five nine three nine, right? And then you figure out what is the binary representation of that, and then you can take two's complement, then you can find out what is the actual thirty-two bit representation. But there is a very easy shortcut to figure out the binary or hexadecimal representation of all, the, all of these values. And it's called GDB, very good. <laughs> okay, so use GDB to help you out. Okay, GDB is a very useful tool. You know, it will do base conversion just like that. Yep. All right, uh, uh, one more thing, like for GDB, like, uh, like pretty much like uh, like I understand like it usually has to be like compiled and linked and all that. No, it doesn't have um, to. It doesn't have to be. So like basically like uh, can you probe like memories and memory uh, spots and, and registers without have without compiling it with GDB? Or that you cannot because GDB if you are probing into memory then you are then the question is who which process okay the memory of which process are you probing into? Unless until you run the program, there's no process to poke into to poke to peek into. So you have to run the program first, set up a breakpoint, then you can you know, stop and say, okay, I want to take a look at the memory locations. But there's no need to do that either if base conversion is all you want to do. You just say GDB, okay, and then you say print, and use all the different ways of using print to give you, you know, to do base conversion for you. 
that okay? All right. So I'm going to do something that is not what you need to do. Um, a print slash d is to interpret the following thing as a decimal signed value. Okay. So I'm going to give it like zero x f f f f f two. <coughs> excuse me, 6D, and it gives me this particular value, which is not signed. Mm. It is supposed to be signed. Maybe I got it wrong here. Okay, if you have any doubt, you know, help X will help you with the X command, which is also the one where it will explain all the different ways to display numbers. So right here, D is supposed to be decimal, mm. and it's U is unsigned, but in this case, Let's see if you would give me something different. Nope, same thing. So there we go. GDB has a bug. Or does it? It doesn't have a bug. The reason why it's not doing the conversion is because an int is 64 bit. I just gave it only 32 bits. I didn't give it enough Fs to become a negative number. Okay. To test that theory, what we'll do is we'll give it enough Fs. So it will need another eight Fs to fill up 64 bits. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And now it's a negative value. Yep. Would it work if you're running the virtual machine? If you do this in the virtual machine, that would have given me a negative number already because the virtual machine is a 32-bit operating system. So integers by default are 32-bit already. This one is natively 64-bit, and that's why you know it it didn't quite give me the result that I was working for, but I but I forgot that this is a 64-bit system, not a 32-bit. Okay. Any other questions? So you can do about the same thing to do the other base conversions that you need to do. I'm not going to show you exactly which command you're going to use. Yep. How do you check if it's like 30, 32 or 64? Ah, that's a good question. Well. You ask GDB <laughs> and say, what is the size of an integer? But size of integer is only four. But what about size of F, 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 260? Yeah, that's not consistent. It's doing some type casting automatically that it, it's not telling me. Because it's supposed to be eight with 64 bit. So there's some kind of inconsistency here. Any other questions? No other questions? There's one sure way to tell for sure, okay? If you say print slash x negative one, oh, that is bad. That is really bad because it, it, it wants to look at this as a 64 bit number but then it looks at this as a 32-bit number. So it's changing depending on the value. Mm. It's not good. Don't like it. <laughs> it's inconsistent. All right. Any other questions? But when you do this inside the 32-bit you know, virtual machine, it should all work out. All right. So no questions about the current homework assignment, the one that's due in a week. Okay, I think you know, once you know how to work with the math, it will tell it will probably take you about 15 minutes, 20 minutes or so to get it done. Alright, so with the homework out of the out of the picture, we'll continue to talk about the topics that we left off from last time which is not going to be a part of the exam one because you know, it, we just got into this. It's control structures. In other words, I was attempting to turn all of you into human compilers, organic compilers, okay? So we'll go ahead and take a look at all of these sections here. I know it looks kind of long, but each one is really short and it makes sense. So what we'll do is we'll start with control structures that we already know of. And the first one is a conditional statement. So we'll start off with something like this, you know, which is a fairly simple skeleton of a conditional statement. 
In this case, C is not really a condition. It is just a placeholder of a condition. In other words, C can be a really complex expression. It doesn't have to be just one single variable. The then block is called block one. Okay, this is block one, which is a chunk of code. Block two is also a chunk of code. Okay? So the first thing we do is we don't even bother to translate it into assembly directly because I want to do this step by step, okay? I don't want to do it in one single step. I want to do it step by step so that the approach can be applied, reapplied to block one and block two and so on. So the first thing I do is I will lose the structure of the code and turn it into something that has no structure, okay? When you look at this piece of code, um, it is not something that your other professors will accept in your homework assignment. Why not? It makes use of? Go to. Go to. And why is go to generally a bad idea? It, it can let something control the structure of your program because you can jump from just about anywhere within a function to anywhere else within the same function. Okay. It sounds really convenient, okay, because you know occasionally you say, oh, I just want to go from here to here, and you know it, a go to and a label will let you do that. But what is that going to do to your code? It makes spaghetti code. It makes spaghetti out of your code, and in this case, you know the reference to spaghetti has nothing to do with the spaghetti monster, the flying spaghetti monster. Just in case somebody is wondering, okay. So why do we call spaghetti code spaghetti code? Somebody really wants pasta. <laughs> okay, so let's let's figure out what is spaghetti code, okay? Because I think some of you know what it is already. Uh, I can never really spell it. That's close enough. Okay, spaghetti code. Okay, spaghetti code is a pejorative phrase for source code that has a complex and tangled control structure. Now they should qualify complex and tangled with unnecessarily complex and tangled. Okay, because there, there's some code you know, that may need to be complex and tangled, but in this case it's unnecessarily. Especially one using, guess what? Many go-to statements, exceptions, threads, or other unstructured branching constructs. It is named such because program flow is conceptually like a bowl of sp spaghetti twisted and tangled. Many of you probably won't understand how bad spaghetti code is from the perspective of maintenance because none of you, for homework assignment purposes, really have to maintain your programs, right? Okay, what is the longest homework assignment that you have to do? Longest in terms of you know the time since it is assigned to the time that it is due. We can have Okay, two weeks, any longer than that? Yeah. Bigger projects, how, how, how much longer? I, I think there were some in Foxes that took like two months. Two months, okay, two months. Okay, we got two months, mm -hmm. any any longer? Okay, there are one year projects. I have taught you know, uh, project classes at Davis and those are three quarter projects. So conceptually you can have a project that will last an entire academic year. Okay, how does that compare to the longevity of source code in the commercial setting? How old is Linux? Linux is actually one of the younger operating systems. How many years? Well, let's look it up. I don't know the exact number. In like 97. 97? Sounds about right. Okay, so we look at Linux. Did you say Linux? Hmm? Oh, no, no, I said Linux. Okay. Unix is old. Yeah. Linux is yeah. not. So Linux is since 1991, okay? And it is considered one of the youngest operating systems, even though it's modeled after one of the older, but not oldest, operating systems. So 91 to today is, what, 20, 20 something years, okay? All right, so, so your one year long project is nothing in terms of lifespan compared to a young operating system. This is not even an old operating system. Is that okay? All right. There's another perspective of code maintenance. In your project, the one year long project, how many people are involved in that project? 
five, six-ish, okay? How many people do you think are involved in Linux? <laughs> now, it's, since it's open source, it's kind of an unfair comparison, but I would say thousands, okay? You know, easily thousands of developers. Okay, why is that important when we talk, when we talk about spaghetti code? Time is important, go ahead. Interaction. Interaction. Coding style, uh -huh. and can anyone else follow your code? Okay, that's the big question. The second thing is, can you follow your own code after a week of creating spaghetti code? Probably not. <laughs> okay, those are the things that you have not experienced just because that you don't write programs that long. Okay, in terms of number of lines, and also in terms of the longevity of the code itself. I, on the other hand, has the misfortune of having to maintain a really old C compiler. It was written in the CPM days, okay, which is kind of really way back when. This is pre-DOS, okay. And uh, the source code, when I read the source code, there was one function that is that exceeds 500 lines. So a single function that 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 will require me to page down like four or five times from the top to the bottom. And it had go tos. Okay? Cruel, multiple go tos. It would go to from deep inside a if that is inside a while, which is inside a switch, which is inside another if, into another conditional statement in a branch that is inside another if, that is inside another while, and so on. Okay? That is spaghetti code. I could not understand the source code. I tried to use a debugger to track through the execution. I could not figure it out. So I ended up having to just cut off the whole subroutine and re-implement based on how it was called. I basically re-implemented re the entire thing. Okay, so most of you probably won't experience you know, spaghetti code just because you know, it doesn't really matter all that much when you have a smaller project. Okay, but in this class, we don't have a choice, okay? We do not have a choice but to use spaghetti code because in assembly language programming, there is no structured code, okay? Now, it doesn't mean that you do not program in a structured way. It is just that the language itself does not have any structure itself, okay? So we'll, we'll, we'll deal with that later. So in this case, can everybody see how this code, which is structured and very nice, turns into this code, which is kind of ugly because it has two go-tos, it is completely flat, but does everybody see how they are equivalent? Mm -hmm. They would do exactly the same thing. Okay, all right. If there's no else, if you just have a conditional statement, there's no else branch, which, is, which looks like this, then it is a little bit easier to look at it because you just look for the negation of the condition and say, hey, if the condition is false, let's skip all the way to L1, which is a continuation label. If C is true, then not C is false, which means it would not do the go-to, then it will execute block one. Is that okay? Does everybody see how the spaghetti version is equivalent to the structured version? Functionally, they are equivalent. All right, so what we're gonna do is we'll do this also to a while loop and also a do while loop. Those two are not too complicated. So this is a typical while loop, okay? You have a while, some condition, and then a block one code that is inside the while loop. It translates into something that's kind of, it doesn't look very nice, okay? You start off with a label L1 because it's a loop, you have to go back to the beginning um, after one iteration. Um, then we check to see whether not C is true, because if not C is true, we go to L2, which is once again a continuation label. It moves on to whatever is next to the while statement. If C is true, not C is false, we are not gonna go to L2. Then we execute block one. After we execute block one, we have a unconditional branch, which is go to going back to L1 so that we can perform another iteration or potentially perform another iteration. Is that okay? Are there any questions about the spaghetti version and how it is functionally the same as the structured version? Any questions? 
No questions? All right. And then the next one is a do while loop. We seldom use a do while control, control structure in most programs, but it is actually the easiest to translate because we execute block one without any question, and then we say if C, okay, if C is true, then we go back to L1 for another iteration. So it's actually the easiest to translate, even though it is not used the most. I don't even bother with a for loop. Why do you think I don't even bother with a for loop? From a functional perspective. A for loop is the same thing as a while loop with the stuff you have stashed over at different places. Do you guys know that part already or do you want me to go over it quickly? Do we have a vote? <laughs> <laughs> go over or not go over? We're good. Are we good? Want to go over? Okay. So I will just go over really quickly. All right. Now remember, uh, C and C++ is a prerequisite of this class, you know, so I'm only doing this to help remind you of features that you should know already. Is there, uh, is there a do until in there? Huh? Is there a do until? Nope. nope. In C and C++ there's no do no, until. No, no. <coughs> I know, not in C, I know, but in uh, assembly. In assembly? Nope. No. There's, no, there's no structured code period. Okay. So I will just break this up into multiple components. You know, this is the initialization. So I'll just say, you know, I, and then this is the condition. This is the post operation. And then inside the loop, you know, we have block one. Okay, this is the actual block of the loop itself. Okay. If I want to translate this into a while loop, the I part would be outside of the loop. The C is the condition of the loop itself. And then we have the block, okay, the block inside the loop, inside the for loop. And then the P, which is a post operation, has to be done after BLK1 is done. So that's functionally the same as a for loop. And that's why I don't even bother to explain how to translate a for loop into a unstructured version, because it really is just a while loop with things you'll know, stash at different places. The only reason why a for loop is useful is because you know if you need to keep track of the condition, you might as well use the same line to keep track of the initialization and the post operation of variables that can change the exit condition. Okay, it's just for notational convenience, it is better to do it that way. But otherwise, you know, it's really the same thing as a while. Okay, so now that we have this out of the way, that's it. Okay, we are done with control structures. But what about switch, you know, the switch statement? Well, the switch statement can be seen as a conditional statement in a way, okay? The implementation of a switch statement many times is really just a uh, nested conditional statement. So it's, there's nothing really that special about a switch statement. Any other questions? Any other questions about control structure? If there are no questions about control structure, then we are going to have to deal with something that's a little bit nastier. Because the condition of the conditional statements can be a long and complex condition. And in assembly language programming, you can only compare, and then you can do a conditional branch. Okay? So we cannot really deal with conjunction, disjunction, and that sort of thing. There's, there are no logical operations in assembly language programming. So when we do have these things, what do we do about them? Well, if you have a not, okay, if the original <coughs> statement looks like this, which is if not C, C being a condition, go to L1, you can get rid of the not by saying if C, go to L2, which is a continuation label. If we do not get to the continuation label, which means C is false, then we go to L1. So it will accomplish exactly the same thing. The code is a little bit messier, but we got rid of the logical operator. Okay, the idea is we want to get rid of logical operators. Is that okay? All right, moving on to the next one. Disjunction, okay? If the original expression is a disjunction, now remember C by itself can be a really huge and complex expression, same thing with D. I just want to take care of one logical operator at a time. Okay, that's all I want to do. 
So if the original one is if C or D go to L1, then we can break it apart and say, hey, if C is true, that is enough reason to go to L1 already, because it's a disjunction. Now, what if C is false? Well, if C is false, I am not going to L1 right away, but I have a second chance to go there, because if D is true, then I also end up at label L1. This is also consistent with short-circuited uh, Boolean evaluation in C and C++. In your previous class in CISP 360, your professor should have told you that um, conjunction and disjunction, um, they are both short-circuited in C and C++, which means if the first condition, like in this case, if C is true, you won't even bother to evaluate D. Was that discussed in your previous class? Was it really emphasized? Because yeah. that's the only thing that allows you to do bound checking when you go through an array and it doesn't do any type of memory access that is illegal. Okay, I'll show you an example. I'm not gonna explain it, but I will show you an example. Okay. So let's say, you know, okay, I'm gonna put comments here. N is the number of elements in array A. Okay, so just want to make it clear. Okay, so a typical loop looking for a particular value in the array would look like this. Okay, if um, i, which is the indexing variable, is less than n, and um, a bracket i does not equal to, oh, this is C and C++, plus plus, not equal to, um, k, which is the value that I'm searching for, then in the loop, you just increment i. So this is a fairly typical way to go through an array so that you're locating a particular value k in the array a, and n is the number of elements. Okay, i should be initialized to zero before this loop, but that's not, that's not the main point. The main point is the logical n operation here. The logical n operation, which is n percent, n percent, is a short-circuited operator, which means if I can determine the outcome of the entire conjunction just by looking at the left-hand side, I won't even bother with the right-hand side, okay? But this is actually very important because if I is less than n is false, that means I is greater than or equal to n, which also means I is no longer a valid index into array A, okay? And that's why it has to be short-circuited because if it's not short-circuited, short then I will still evaluate the right-hand side. Then I'll be accessing a location that is not a part of the array. And that's wrong, okay? Even though it doesn't really do any harm in this case, it is still a wrong thing to do. So that's why you know, a short-circuited evaluation with AND and OR, conjunction and disjunction in C and C++, is actually a part of the language specification itself. It is not just an implementation detail, it is a specification of the programming language. And that is also why when you have a conjunction or disjunction, the evaluation order is always left to right. Okay? That is not left to the compiler, it's not left to implementation, the standard dictates that it has to go from left to right. Is that okay? All right, so, <clears throat> Hopefully this is just you know, a reminder of something that you already know. If not, you know, then you just learn something new that is actually important. All right, so is that okay? Next one is conjunction. Okay, so if the original thing says, if C and D go to label L1, then we can translate that and say, oh, if C is false, then the whole thing is gonna be false might as well just go to L2 right away and skip the other part because of short-circuited evaluation. On the other hand, if C is true, not C is false, I am not going to go to L2. I am going to evaluate D. If D is also true, then I will end up at L1. Are there any questions about the equivalency between the original code, which is the top part, and the translated code in the, in the bottom part? Yep. So the translator code, um, you have to implement the or. Uh, you have to implement the not. The what? The not, not operator? The not operator, yes. So you have to write code such that 
Well, then you go back to 4.1 and deal with negation using that technique. In other words, every single time we only take care of the outermost logical operator. As a result of that, you can still end up with some additional operator. You just recursively take care of those operators until there is none left. Okay. So when you look at C and C++, if you take care of all the logical operators, eventually it will boil down to what? Sorry? Say again? Yeah, so, you know, so how, how, typically what do you use to specify a condition in C and C++? Okay, we, we just had one example, right? We have while i is less than n, so what is this? It doesn't have any logical operators, it is a? It's a comparison, it's a comparison. Do we know how to compare in assembly? We have the CMP, you know, something instruction. So we know how to compare. Can we compare and confirm a number is less than another number? Yes, we can, because we can use conditional branch instructions. We can branch below, we can branch above, we can branch equal to or Z, we can branch L, lower than, greater than, and so on. So we can you know, do all of these things in assembly, and that's why I need to boil everything down to comparison. By the time we get to comparison, we know how to do that in assembly. Is that okay? Okay. All right. So moving on to the notes. So going back up again. Simple reductions. Okay, so there are certain times when you have a negation, and you don't want to blindly use the rule and make it more complicated than it has to be. Because if the negation applies directly to a comparison, like in, in the first case, if the negation is applied to x is greater than or equal to y, then you can just convert the comparison itself so it is just checking whether x is less than y. It is equivalent and you don't need to make the control structure any more complicated than it has to be. Okay. So this is optimization at an expression level, so we don't blindly apply the technique that we just talked about earlier. Um, you can also see something like this, you know, x is less than y or x is greater than y, and you can simplify that to x does not equal to y. So whenever you have a chance, you know, to perform Boolean algebra and just normal algebra to make the complexity, to reduce the complexity, do that. Because otherwise, you'll be complicating the control structure to accomplish the same thing, which makes your code a bit more difficult to understand. Are we still doing OK so far at this point? OK, all right. So let's take it back up, back up. Um, then we're dealing with comparison here. OK, so comparison is just like this. OK, so let me show you how to read this part here. People coming from CISP 440, you know, I kind of have to mention this, you know, this is a relation, R is a relation. I know you guys don't want to be reminded of that stuff anymore, but that's what it is. <laughs> so X R Y is X relates to Y in a certain way, it can be less than, greater than, less than or equal to, greater than or equal to, not equal to, or equal to, okay. So the question is, if it is already reduced to something simple like that, how do we do that in assembly? And the answer is down here. If this is the C statement that you're translating, assuming X and Y are simple expressions or just variables, then you can just you know, turn it into something like that. Note how Y and X are reversed. Okay? In other words, compare is a subtract instruction, so it is actually subtracting Y from X, but not storing the result. That is why we have to reverse it, because y is being subtracted from x. The r, the jr, there's no, well, there is an instruction called jr, I think it's jump relative, but in this case, this r is representing the same r in the original expression. In other words, if this is less than, then this r is l, or b, depending whether it is signed or not. If this r is equal to, you know, equal, equal in, C and C++, 
then this R becomes Z, because after a subtraction, we, we are looking for zero, because when two, two things are the same, you know, then the zero flag should be set. Is that okay? So does everybody understand how to read this part here? If you see this in the C code, you will translate that into something like that in assembly code. Okay, any questions? So there's one example here. The example is if we have, if y is less than or equal to 5, go to label L1, then we say compare dollar $5 because in this case, uh, 5 is the actual value being compared. It's not specifying the location where you grab a value to compare. So we compare one, uh, 5 to the constant 5 to y, and JNA is not above. Okay, less than or equal to is the same thing as not about, not greater than. So that's how it works. Are we, yep, go ahead. No, you cannot. You cannot specify a dollar five on. So I mean, on, let's look, um, let's compare y and x. Uh -huh. So keeping the JL, Then it'll be, but then you won't be keeping the relation. In other words, your assembly code will, will have a one twist to uh, make it different from the original C code. So I'm trying to make it, it is, I'm trying to make it as straightforward as possible. So if the original comparison is looking for less than, you keep that less than. All right, are there any questions about this slide? No questions about this slide? All right, so we're moving on to section six. How do we deal with uh, nesting and labels? Because, you know, after all, in structured programming, you can have a conditional statement inside the loop and so on. So how do we deal with that? There are different ways to do it. Okay. The first one is I personally like to use indentation. In other words, if I look at the indentation of my assembly code, it will still give me the same structure as in the original code. Because indentation is, is very visual. It gives you a very good visual clue of what is inside what else. The second thing is to use more useful names. You know, Even though I use generic label names like L1, L2, and so on, it is much more helpful when you label, when you use label names like loop begin, begin loop, doesn't matter which one you use, while begin, okay? Um, while end, else, it, else can be used as a label because else is not a reserved word in assembly language programming. Because we don't have structured code. If you don't have structured code, why do you need else? Okay? And if is a good name too, you know, this is the continuation label of a conditional statement. You guys will see me use these particular label names you know, when I write code in this class. Next one is to use sequential numbers. In other words, you just kind of keep going, you know, if once you have used one label name, which is L and if one here, the next one is going to be and if two, okay? But you do have to be careful because if you reuse and if one where and if two is needed, the assembler won't complain, okay? If you if you mess up the definition, it will complain. In other words, if this two here is changed to a one, then we have two duplicate definitions of and if one, and the assembler will complain because one label can only be defined once. On the other hand, if you mistype here when you refer to the label, then the assembler cannot help because, you know, well, there is an and if one, and you can definitely go to and if one from multiple places. So the assembler would not be able to catch it when you make a mistake like that. Any questions? Okay, no questions. You can also, you, when you deal with nested co constructs, you can, you can always make it possible. It's always possible to make it so that the naming convention makes it impossible to have duplicate labels. Like in this case, we have a while loop on the outside, a conditional statement in the inside. 
So when I do the translation, this is not even assembly code. This is really just what I call flattening a program. Okay. When we turn structured code, nice looking, proper, you know, structured code like this into something that looks like this. It is still in C, okay, but it doesn't have structure anymore. I, I call this flattening because it, it doesn't have structure anymore. Okay, when we refer to structure code, it means you have a statement inside another statement inside another statement that is called structure code. In this case, it is quote unquote structured because the go to is always inside the conditional statement. But other than that, there is no other structure. Like Z++ is by itself. It is not a part of a conditional statement. Let me just highlight which Z++ we are talking about. This one here. This Z++ statement has exactly the same level. It's in the same level as this label definition. Z++ and X++ are ex at exactly the same level, lexically speaking, from the perspective of the compiler. And that's why there's no structure anymore. So changing the code from structure code into something that is unstructured, I personally just call that flattening. Okay, so when you hear me saying, okay, let's flatten this C code, it means getting rid of the structure of the code. Yep, let's go again. I thought there was a question. All right. So are there any questions about this? Oh, the other part is, instead of just using a generic name of and if, I say this is the end if inside loop one. So this loop is loop one. This conditional statement is the first conditional statement inside the loop. And you can see how the label name suggests that. Okay, this is the end if, this is the end of the first conditional statement inside the first loop. So that means it if, I, if you use this naming convention, it becomes impossible to have duplicate label names. But you do have to count, okay, you know, is this the first loop, the second loop, and so on, in order to use this construct. It doesn't have to be like this, okay, I'm just giving you suggestions, okay, because you, you will get homework assignments where you have to translate C code into assembly code. If you can keep track of L1, L2, okay, go ahead, just use L1, L2, and so on. If you want a more structured approach, you know, this is a slightly more structured approach. But for the most part, I will leave, leave it up to you guys, leave it up to you guys to determine how you want to label, how you, how you want to name the labels. All right. Boolean operator reduction formulation, you know, same thing, you know, you know, I just put a suffix of underscore one in this case. So in the end, it is really just, you know, whatever you, whatever works best for you, okay? I just give you some examples. This is just an example of how to translate, you know, a, un, you know, some structure code like this into assembly code. I'm not going to do this in class because because you can read it, <laughs> okay? Because I did this. Okay, this entire thing is already done in steps. So the first thing to do that I normally do is to do this, okay? I turn the entire C program into assembly code by comment commenting out everything. And then what I do is I would just do a few things, you know, interleaved. So I would just implement the assembly code interleaved within the commented out C code. So this way I can still establish the context of my assembly code. Yes? Okay, so on line three, line four, line five, that's like declaring variables? Um, kind of, okay, but it's not the same thing. Now, there are several things you have to remember. In assembly language programming, there's no such thing as type. In other words, we do have three labels, X, Y, and Z. Sounds like variables, but they're not. Because each one, X, Y, and Z, each one is really just a label, and each label is representing the address of are we talking about one byte, or are we talking about 32 bits? Nope, one byte. Every label is just a number, and each number is only the address of one byte. So X is really just the address of the least significant byte of the first dot in zero. If you use it incorrectly, the, the assembler is not gonna complain and say, hey, you really should use a move long because you know X 
is a label of a 32 bit number. Nope, the assembler does not know that at all. The assembler only knows that X is just a number. It so happens to be an address. Okay. So X, Y, and Z are labels to places in memory okay. that have the, num the value of zero assigned to them? That has the uh, memory allocated and initialized to zero. Okay. okay. All right. And you, we, we also see something that we haven't seen before, which is dot data. When you use variables, we have to switch to the data section because the code section, which has the name of dot text, which is also the default in the segment, cannot be changed. So you have to switch to the data segment in order to declare variables. We won't be staying with the dot data much longer because at some point we'll switch to the stack. Okay, but I'll do this step by step. The exit code uh, in assembly looks like this. I'm not going to explain what it means at this point. We will get to that you know, later on. All right, so the next thing I do is the initialization. I look at x equals 5, and then so say, oh, OK, I can translate that into one single assembly code, which is you know, just moving the constant of 5 into x. But remember, x is not known as a 32-bit number. x is really just a label which happens to have the value of an address of one byte, okay? In other words, if this x is a dot word or a dot byte, and you do something like this, the assembler won't complain. You'll be overwriting something other than what you think you should be overwriting, but the assembler does not know that. Is that okay? So when you adjust from C, C++ programming to this class, you have to remember you know, a label has no type information in it. So you have to be more, much more careful than in your other classes. All right, so this is not you know, too fun at this point. So the first thing I do is I'm translating the while loop into assembly, well, no, I take it back. I'm, I'm still translating individual assignment statements. So this is an assignment statement. This is an assignment statement. I translate that into actual code, and you can, you, you don't have to do it in this order, okay, I'm just picking this particular order. This is, um, okay, we take care of the innermost conditional statement. Okay, so this is where we take care of the innermost conditional statement. The original innermost conditional statement looks like this, okay, so we want to convert it into something that is, um, that's not what that's easier to express, so we want to reduce you know, all those logical operators. So if the original conditional statement is to say, if this, then we perform the dead block, then the first thing we do is we negate the condition, and then we go to a continuation label, and you notice that I forgot a semicolon here, but this code is not gonna get compiled, so it's okay. If it does get compiled, I, have, I need to have one semicolon after this one. Okay, so the next step is to look at the negation and say, okay, how do we you know, get rid of the negation? So instead of you know, implementing the whole thing in assembly, I decide to change it. Okay, let's see, how did I make that change? I think I applied the Morgan's Law. Yep, there we go. So I applied the Morgan's Law to the original expression. So I take this original expression. Let's see. Okay, this is one chunk. This is the other chunk. So the negation applied to the disjunction here. So when I apply the Morgan's law, I negate one part of the, I, I, I negate the left-hand side of the disjunction. I negate the right hand side of the disjunction because equal to, once it is negated, becomes not equal to. And then I change the uh, disjunction into a conjunction. That's how the Morgan's law apply. Okay, so I, I, try, I try to defer getting rid of the negation as much as possible. And then after that, I translate this one, which is a conjunction, into. Um, into two conditional statements. So when you look at this portion, okay, these two, including the label, okay, look at these three lines, okay? These three lines implement the same thing as this one single line. 
because I, I, I'm, just taking, I'm just taking care of this conjunction here. The other one still has a negation on top of it. Is that okay? In other words, I just do it step by step. Okay, the rest is going to be really boring because you know it really is just me reading out the use of Boolean algebra you know, throughout the whole thing. So fast forwarding all the way to the bottom. So this is the entire finished program. And you can see I kind of keep track of all the transformations in between because in case I made a mistake, this allows me to track down which you know where I made the mistake. It track it allows me to uh, remember how I derived the actual code. So are there any questions about the process of compiling, you know, at least from the perspective of doing it manually? No questions? So I should have you know, asked you guys to do something like this for the new homework assignment instead of the other one. Yeah, this looks way easier. <laughs> All right, so let's go ahead and you know go back up and go all the way up. And so on. Because I'm gonna go back to middle. There we go. All right. The other one, which is also called control structure, and it says in, in parentheses older. This is really the same thing. It gives you the same kind of information, except you know the, the the organization of the material is slightly different, but it's consistent with the other one. So if you read the first one, you don't quite understand, you can read the second one. But if you read the first one, it's OK. You don't need to read the second one. All right, so we are done with control structures. Are there any questions about control structures, how to do the translation? Let's do one example in class, OK? Just just so that we know what we're dealing with. All right. So I will start with a C program. So if I were to do something like this, and this is how you might want to do your homework assignments, okay? So let's see. Find the min two. Find the minimum of two variables. That's that's what it means. So find min two dot c. I will start with the C code. So the C code looks like this. And we have to read in two integers. Let's not even deal with that, okay? So instead of reading in the two integers, I just use initialization for testing purposes. So x starts with a value of 32, y starts with a value of 17, okay? So the code defines a minimum of two variables and assign it to the third one. It's fairly easy. You guys know this already. So the point is, how do we deal with this? If x is less than y, then x is the minimum. Else, y is the minimum. Okay. So we have min equals x here, and then we have min equals y over here. And the compiler will complain if I don't specify return zero. So that's the original C code. Is that okay? All right. So if this is okay, we'll go ahead and find out. Okay, how do we translate this? Do we want to work with something more complex, or is this okay? That's okay? All right. All right, so what I'll do is I'm gonna do this step by step. So we'll save this one, and then we'll save it again under a different name. Find bin to a.c, and then we go back to the original one, because this time I am going to change this program and flatten it. Okay, first of all, assuming I don't make any stupid syntax error, can this program run? Yeah, we can run it in GDB and to make sure the code is correct, okay? So the next question is, the first step is not to translate everything into assembly first. Now I know some of you can probably look at this code and just right away convert it into assembly code because this one is simple enough. But in general, what we want to do is to flatten the code, debug it as much as we can in C, because it's easier to spot problems in C and C++ before we translate it into assembly code. So we'll do the flattening, and then we can test the program again. The flattening, in this case, is to negate the less than 
so that it would go to the label. Okay, so we'll translate this and say the first version is to say, okay, if x is greater than or equal to y, then we want to go to a label. We call it label else one. Okay, you cannot use else because else is a reserved word in C and C++. So else is no longer needed here because I have else one being a label definition. But then I have one more thing I need to do. I need an unconditional go to here to go to the end of the if. So we go to end if as a label and define end if as a label over here. So if I, if I did not make a mistake, this should be equivalent to the original code. Is that okay? Is this program still in C? In C++? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's still in C and C++, which means you can still use GDB to debug this code. If the behavior of this code is different from my other C program, then you know that the flattening process is faulty. So you should fix it first before you try to translate it into assembly code. The idea is, once again, try to defer the translation into assembly code as late as possible, because it, it is easier to debug in C and C++. Is that okay? All right, so at this point, I look at this code and go like, yeah, I think it's ready to convert into assembly code, because I look at everything, it seems like it's easy to do in assembly code. So now, I would actually go ahead and do it in assembly. So the first thing I do is to line one to the end of the program. I think it's yank. There we go. So I'm just doing a copy and paste here. Split the screen into two. Oh, I want the vertical split. How to unsplit it. Okay. We'll, do the, we'll do it the hard way. All right, so we'll look at another program, and this is the assembly code. So once again, we'll do this one to end of, we'll end of the program, uh, do a yank, and on the other side, do a paste. So now we have just copied and pasted everything. And the first thing we want to do is to add a pound sign at the beginning of every single line and that will do it in VI. And that's why I like VI because it allows me to do you know, stuff like that. And this is really simple by comparison okay, of what VI can do. Alright, so the next thing we'll do is to translate this into assembly code. So we look at the variable declaration and go like, well, we need to switch to the data segment because these are variables. They will change when we run the code program. Okay, so we say x colon dot int x dot int zero, y colon dot int zero, and the min is the same thing here. A dot int whatever is fine, okay, because we are going to reinitialize the values anyway. I just put a zero here because it's easy. Okay. All right, so now that we have done all the data declaration, it's time to do a dot global start, change our segment back to the text segment, which is where the code goes, and then start label start here. Okay, x equals 32. That's pretty easy to do. Move L dollar 32 to x. We'll do this trick. Move L dollar 17 y. We'll do this trick. And I look at min equals x. Well, yeah, that's kind of easy, but this won't do it. Okay, move x to min is not going to work. Why this is not going to work has to do with limitations of the assembly instruction. There's a there's a hidden rule. Okay, well it's not really hidden, but most people would not expect it. At least you know, not the first time they write programs in assembly. In assembly programming using the x86 architecture, only one, up to one operand can specify content in memory, okay? Only up to one can specify con uh, content in memory. In this case, how many things do we have to be specified that lives in memory? Two things, okay? X is in memory, so is min. So this is not gonna work. The assembler will, in fact, complain and say, uh-uh, oh, you cannot do this. So what you need to do is to use a register 
to help you out. That will do it. Okay, you just need you know, the first instruction. X is in memory, but EAX is a register. E, uh, the register is not in memory. So that will work. Um, I'm not going to deal with anything related to control structure this time. So we'll just go ahead and deal with this one too. Same thing, move LY to EAX, and then we move LEAX to min. There we go. Do we have any questions at this point? Okay, now let's go back and deal with the control structure. The control structure has label definitions. Well, the good thing is, when you, de when you define a label in C and C++, the syntax is exactly the same as when you define a label in assembly language programming. So that part we get to keep, it's no big deal. The important part is, how do we get this part done? If x is greater than or equal to y, go to else one. Ah, but you remember in my text, there is a very structured way to do it. You say CMPL in this case because we're dealing with 32-bit comparison. Flip the operands, okay? If x, if the original comparison is x is blah, 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 y, then you reverse the order when you compare. Because that's the reason why you can keep the relationship. So j, in this case, is greater than or equal to. I don't know whether there's a greater than or equal to, and this is sign, but I know greater than or equal to is the same thing as not less than. So J and L will do it. Are we doing okay so far with this translation? Greater than or equal to is the same thing as not less than because the variables are signed to begin with. I cannot say J and B because J and B makes use of the carry slash borrow flag. It is only good for unsigned values. If it is signed, I have to make use of the L flag, which is defined using the overflow and the sign bit. Yep. Where's the J coming from? Jump. Oh. So we do an unconditional branch to, uh, excuse me, we're doing a conditional branch to else one here. And then over here, we have an unconditional branch. So we say jump to end if. And we have the whole program translated, except for the return zero. Is that okay? And you can see that when I translate the code, I don't do it like from line one to the last line. Okay, I do it in a structured way. Any questions? No questions? Okay. Hmm. Well, given that we have all this stuff here, I think we can already do some fundamental, really, you know, low-level string functions. What do you think? How about pointers? Okay, let's 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 see what, what we can do at this point. Okay. All right. So we get up this one. Let's do I don't know string compare. Okay. String compare, and I'm going to do everything in the assembly files, you know, so I'm skipping the C file. But I will give you the source code in the assembly code first, just so that we know what we are translating. Okay, so we're dealing with string compare. How many people do not know what is string compare, what it, what it is supposed to do? It's okay, because if your CISP 360 professor is strictly using C++, then you may not have learned how to use string compare. Does everybody know how to use a string compare? Okay, if you don't, what do you do? Google it. You can Google it, but the first thing I would do is to man it. Take a different professor to man it. Take it from a different professor. But you cannot go back in time and fix things. Even Doctor Who does not do that. Sorry, sir. Well, you will end up with... Consequences. No, no, it's called consequences, but there's a... Words paradox, those paradox. paradox, you can end up with a paradox. So even Doctor Who has to avoid himself in the past. But he doesn't break yeah. the rule all the time. Well, he bends rules. He doesn't <laughs> break rules. It's hard to break something that practically never existed in the first place. And he learned it multiple times. You know, oh, it, that was a bad idea. 
Let's do it again. Wasn't there an episode where there were three different versions of him in a jail cell together? I think so. Yeah. <laughs> but those are different uh, reincarnations too, but they're not even the no, same. I think it's still. Yeah. And they talk together. Yeah. Okay, so this is string compare, okay? So the thing about string compare is it returns um, an integer, and the only thing it tells you about the integer is whether it's zero, greater than zero, or less than zero. Okay? It doesn't tell you how much it is greater than zero. It may be one, maybe two. It doesn't tell you how much is below zero. It can be negative one, it can be negative two. So this is string compare, and let's go ahead and see if we can write this in C first, okay? Because you cannot do any translation into assembly code unless you already know how to do it in C. So we'll go ahead and we'll take a look at the C code. Well, let's just do the C code. So I'm going to do strictly the C code here, string compare. Um, what are the two parameters to string compare? What, kind, what type are we dealing with here? Strings. Strings, which is char Strings. pointers, okay? Um, whenever you have a chance, you should use const in C and C++ programming. In this case, should we use const? Yes. And where do we put the const? Ah, because there are multiple ways to put the const, okay? Because the thing is, you know, we have a uh, string A here, and then we have string B over there, okay? It's char string B. So in this case, um, the C component, if I, in the subroutine, if I change Whatever string A or string B points to, the, assembly, the compiler will say it's okay because these are not const pointers. But there are two places where I can put a const with each parameter. The first place to put a const is here. Okay? So what that means is whatever the pointer points to, excuse me, the pointer itself is a const. I cannot change the pointer itself, but I can change whatever it points to. It doesn't make sense in this case, because I have to scan through the whole thing. I have to change the pointer. So this place for putting const here does not make any sense, because I'm restricting that I do not change the pointer itself. The other place to put a const is over here. This means I am putting a restriction on whatever it points to. Okay, I can change the pointer all I want, but I cannot change what it points to. That makes more sense, because I'm just comparing. I'm not supposed to change anything that it is pointing to. So that's where the const should go to. So same thing over here. Okay, now we have two consts. All right, in here, what are you gonna do with string A and string B? How many people think, eh, I'm gonna use array indexing here? That will work, okay, but that's a lot of extra work, okay? We can do everything with pointers. Compare the contents of the two Sorry? Compare the contents of the two We compare where they point, exactly. The content pointed to by the pointers, okay? All right, so we know some kind of a loop is involved, okay? And we may have something to do inside the loop here. We also need to return some kind of a value, okay? Okay, so we know the structure of the code is gonna be like this. When do I stay in the loop? In other words, when can I not <coughs> determine and say that, hey, I got the result of the comparison? Okay. But when everything is the same up to this point, and I have not encountered the null terminator, then I have to stay in the loop, okay? Because I cannot tell, I cannot conclude just yet, okay? So let's see if we can express that. So to express that, we have to basically say, uh, whatever string A points to is not the same thing as whatever string B points to. That's one of the conditions to stay in the loop. But there's one more. What if they are both, oops, I, I said one thing and I, okay, they have to be the same, not, not different. If they're different, it's time to get out, okay? But this is only one of the reasons to stay in the loop. We have another reason to stay in the loop. Because what if string A is pointing to null, string B is also pointing to null? Then I can already make the conclusion and say the two strings are exactly the same. And I should get out. 
So I need to attach something to the condition and say what? If multiplied by how? Well, if if I get to this part, it means they are the same. So I only need to make sure one of them is put into a non-null character. Okay, but you you have the right idea. And the simplest way to do that is just that. I don't even bother with the comparison. Because in C and C++, well, in C at least, if an expression is zero, it is the same thing as false. If it is non-zero, which in this case can be the, the other 255 values, it is simply interpreted as true. So this is fine. I don't have to compare this to the null character, okay? You know, it's just a little shortcut thing, you know, is it a good programming practice? Probably not, but you know, it, it works. I believe that works in C++ as well. Okay, it doesn't work in Java. Okay. Yeah, Java requires comparison. Yep. Um, when you say you were uh, bringing in a string from console input, uh, and it already had a value that was say 10 and then the null character, but this one was only five and then the null character, wouldn't it uh, just put that there and then not deal with the rest because the null character would then uh, be the front? And so if you were to compare two, it's possible that you'd reach the null with and okay. put the string itself. Say that one more different. time. The, what, what two strings are we comparing? So say there's one with 10 uh, and then a null character that you have one, initially. One, zero, and then a null character like that. Or I meant 10 characters. 10 characters? Yeah. Okay. All right. Or we could do five since it'd be a simpler array. Okay, let's do five. Yeah. So we have, let's say, A, B, C, D, E. Yeah. A, B, C, D, E, and then a null character. So if you... And then the second string is... Let's just say A, B, C. Okay, A, B, C, and then a null character. Like so if you were right? to bring that into, um, or take it from console input, uh -huh. and then apply it to the first one, wouldn't it just uh, update it as A, B, C, null character, and then it also have E and then another null character, because it doesn't do cleanup? Wouldn't it? No. Well, then you have one pointer pointing to this one, and the other pointer pointing to this one. I'm saying, like, one. if you were to update those values before you, uh, before you even use string compare, then technically you would reach the null. If you're comparing it to ABC, it would say it's true, but it technically would also have E and then the other null character. If you overwrite the D with a null character, yes. But then the question is, what are you passing to string compare? If you're comparing these two, it's easy because. A equals E, A, they're both non-null. B equals B, they're both non-null. C equals C, they're both non-null. These two are not the same, it's time to get out. Yep. Like, uh, what, if, what if it's the other way around? Because like, at that, at that point, that after it hits, this, it hits the null character, then uh, pretty much, uh, oh, never mind that. Because they have to be the same in order to stay in the loop. If one is null, the other one is non-null, I get out immediately. Is null the same as zero? Null is zero, but it's an 8 bit zero. So when you say end uh, string A, um, if it returns a null, that returns zero. Right. So if, it is, if, it, if string A is pointing to null, then that becomes false, which also will get us out of the loop, which is proper, because once we get to the end of the string, we should get out. The return. Okay, let's finish the loop first. What else do we have to do in the loop? If the loop is exactly like this, we have a problem because we'll be comparing the same characters over and over and over again. So what do we need to do to kind of move on? Just increment the pointers, okay? So we say increment the pointer A, increment pointer B. Okay, that's the only, those are the only two things we have to do. The thing is, the question is, what do we do when we get out? Okay, I'm supposed to return a zero when both strings are the same. I'm supposed to return a negative value when string A is quote unquote less than string B. I'm supposed to return a positive number when string A is quote unquote greater than string B. Okay, so based on this little example here, the expression is actually surprisingly simple. You just say string A, whatever string A points to, minus whatever string B points to, that's it. That's all you need to do. But hold on a second here. We got a problem. <coughs> because string A is appointed to a character, string B is appointed to a character, and yet the return type is an integer. 
Um, don't we need to do something about this? Not in C and C++ because it's a high level programming language. You have type promotion that can be that can happen automatically. So that's why in C and C++ programming, the compiler is doing a lot of stuff for you already. You don't have to worry about this. We won't have enough time to finish this, but I do want you to think about it, okay? So think about this. We won't get back to this on Thursday because we have our exam one on Thursday. So we'll come back to this next Tuesday. So that gives you one week to kind of work on this one along with the homework assignment. You don't have to turn this one in, okay? But I do want you to kind of think about it because based on what we have talked about up to this point, we already can do this. Not as a subroutine, but just the logic itself, we can already do this. All right, I'm stopping the recorder. Um, I will be available at the lab in case anyone wants to start doing the homework assignment or study. Or has any additional questions. Okay. Thank you.